Welcome back uh, to learnpiezo.org. Uh, today we will be continuing on lecture fourteen, part B. So in part A, we were going over um, how we control. And in essence, it's controlling any type of uh, actuator, um, not just a piezo, uh, but how do we control our piezo in resonance to produce a constant output? So, and the way I mentioned we do this is we control voltage and we control frequency. So, frequency is controlled to produce a stable phase angle. So, that's that basically tells you if this is a, a let's say the displacement of your transducer and this is frequency, then where you where we exactly lie relative to, to this point is the same basically by tracking the phase to a certain phase angle, let's say we track it to this phase angle here, um, then we would always end up in the same relative position according to the peak. And the other aspect of that was voltage. Uh, and I mentioned as the load of your device uh, changes, uh, perhaps you are engaging with whatever material you are uh, working on, or whatever you're actuating against that force changes then your maximum peak of displacement will decrease but you want to maintain that same constant output so in that case not only do you need to optimize your frequency which you are driving but you also need to increase your voltage at this point to maintain at all times that constant volt uh, input so if we had displacement versus time um, we want like let's say we had a constant voltage uh, situation. Then we hit a load. And then the load went, came off. Uh, you see this point is not constant. Whereas if we were to vary the voltage, so if you hit that load, you might see a dip, but you would recover very quickly. You may overshoot and ring. But essentially, you wouldn't have a large change in uh, output. And again, that f the frequency also helps to maintain the ideal position uh, in order that voltage can be acceptable because the frequency shift can be such. For example, we have one curve here and one curve here. And let's call this frequency and let's call this displacement. So if, we get, if, if a load comes on our device, the resonance frequency can shift from here to here. And if we were, if we were before we were all had our operating point right there, when that frequency shifts, we would decrease our voltage significantly. So our voltage would now be down here. And if our voltage is that low, I mean, sorry, our displacement would be that low. So even if we doubled our voltage, we wouldn't even be able to get to that same point back, back up here. So therefore, we have to optimize our frequency, and then we can increase voltage a little bit to, to maintain that counts an output. So uh, in this lecture we're going to be speaking about how a piezo without an external sensor because this whole this whole idea uh, revolved around the fact that we know our displacement amplitude. So it revolves around the fact that we know our displacement amplitude And it revolved around the fact that we knew the phase angle of that displacement amplitude to the input voltage, which is the uh, driving signal. But in reality, it's it, we don't have that information unless you 
apply an external sensor. So applying the external sensor would require more electronics. It would require um, the sensor itself, which could be very expensive to be able to sense uh, such high vibration on you know the kilohertz scale and the micrometer range. Uh, this would be very tough to do. So usually you would require a sensor more much like many times or many many times the cost of your piezo but thankfully we don't need to do that do not need to use external sensor except in very uh specific precise applications so in general what we can use for a sensing application to understand uh, for the most part what the piezo is doing is current and I'll explain this in the next slide so to a piezo let's just assume this is a piezo here this is a block diagram so we input voltage at a certain frequency or omega is better frequency uh, metric and what we get out is displacement on the mechanical side and on the electrical side the response characteristic is current which is capital I so what is current in a piezo and where does it come from Current in a piezo comes from charge. So if we have a certain charge, we'll call it Q. Then the derivative of charge, basically charge over time, which is basically coulombs per second, which is amps. This relationship would then be, you take the derivative of this versus time, and you would get QO omega cosine omega t equals current. So basically the, alter, the alternating charge on a piezoelectric material is what is causing current. So what the claim is now that this current So let's let's back up again. Where is this charge coming from? The charge is coming from alternating stress. Uh we know that one of the fundamental equations if you want to think of it about it simply is uh Sorry, that's not the best way to do it. So under uh, constant load conditions, the charge produced on a piezoelectric material is equal to the stress you put on that. But in a um, in a situation, and this is this is assuming that you immediately get your strain. I'm going to call strain lowercase x stress capital case capital x but this is this is assuming a static condition uh in, in which you immediately get to your strain so we actually have to look at strain in order to come up with this parameter so d divided by compliance because uh normally we input a stress, you multiply it by, by compliance, you get a strain. So strain divided by S equals capital X. Okay, that's good. All works well. In this case, that's Q. Okay. So basically, that charge is not coming from the capacitance anymore. 
because normally when we apply a voltage over a piezo, we get uh, we get a, we get a charge, but that comes from the capacitance. But now we're at resonance, so in resonance, the mechanical behavior dominates the response. So therefore, we need to look toward this type of equation in order to determine what the charge is. <clears throat> and the charge is again due to the stress, or due to the strain, which then causes the charge, and which whose integral, whose derivative, is the current. So, this is how, so if we can measure current, and we can measure its amplitude, and its phase, you know, the phase, or you can call it that, or you can call it theta, whatever you want to call it, of the current, then if you can measure the amplitude, and if you can measure the phase, we can get an idea about where we are at resonance. We can get an idea about that, uh, about our phase of our displacement, and we can get an idea about our amplitude of displacement for this piezo. Well, what about when we get to a transducer? When you get to transducer, how, how does this all play out? Because all everything I mentioned here kind of related directly to a piezoelectric material itself um, and you know because it has it has its uh, you must you will say we're driving it like this and this is the ground side and we have a signal coming in here uh, from this other other electrode and we have some polarization like that um, so these this is all well and good but this refers directly to a piezoelectric material how do we scale this equation or understand it according to a uh, multi-part transducer which has you know metal components potentially plastic components uh, and other uh, complex geometries rather than just a simple like piezoelectric disc or or some type of piezoelectric bar or block or something and we will go over that so let's take a piezoelectric piezo transducer, and I'll just grab it from the internet right now. So this is a piezoelectric transducer. Uh, it has a metal component here, a metal component there. Uh, it has the piezoelectric rings here, four of them, and opposing polarity, such that when you put voltage on, so that you can connect these terminals, you can connect these terminals, and you can drive one with the positive voltage and have one at the negative or ground and you will get uh, expansion and contraction and that, that's not the point here the point here is how can we determine the uh, the displacement let's say on this end which is going to be interacting I think this is a welder so it's going to be interacting with those two, maybe two metal plates in order to get them to fuse together Um, and that will use ultrasound to get that. So how do we determine um, the displacement here, or how do we control that from the current we'll be reading from here? Well, how how can we justify the use of this and that? So this and this the general idea of this is that there is a uh, bolt here which is going to go all the way through and it's going to screw into this other component here so there will be threads there and these all, all, all of this will be pretty much one solid body when this device will be operating at resonance you know when a single piezoelectric material let's say it's a square and let's say you have electrodes here and you have an electrode here and you have polarization like this, and you have your alternate, and you have your ground, you'll experience at resonance something like that. So this is a displacement outward, so this would be its extension, like this is exaggerated, but this is the vibration direction. It'll be going outward, and as you get farther away from the, from the center, you have more displacement. However, the node will point, 
the point of highest strain or stress is going to be in the center and the and over here there's no uh, there at the at the edges there are no there's no stress in, the, in a theoretical sense or if there is a load on the edge it'll be such that it only alters this wave partially so this would be the essential uh, mode shape or distribution uh, of uh, displacement and distribution of strain in a solid piezoelectric element, let's say it's rectangular or cylindrical. But for a composite material device, which has many components, many materials, including the piezoelectric one, if we then draw its displacement, It's not the easiest thing to draw. It will be something like this. So depending on the mass and the stiffness of these external components, uh, there'll be some internal reflection, but at the residence, there'll be the most transfer of energy, and the most um, uh, effective buildup of energy at that frequency for stimulation, uh, for a given stimulation. So um, we have here some discontinuities, slight because we change materials, but this will be the essential form. All right. So this is the displacement. I'm just going to call that D. It's confusing, but I'm going to do it. And then when we get to our other case, strain. So strain is obviously you take the uh, uh, derivative with regards to this regular little, little x. Let's say it's you know our uh, axis here. Let's call this x. X and this is a cursive X, kind of this curly X is the strain. Um, so we would have the most strain at the piezo in the middle. Then it would come down, and apparently this flattens out, so they'll be like a little bit higher. The strain would be continuous. So you would have something like this, so you go down, wouldn't quite read zero, then we would perhaps go down farther, and similar case here, we'd go down, and then it could be something like that. Alright, but the basic point is that there's, there's a nodal point here. And we have the strain. We can calculate the average strain on the piezos. And the average strain on the piezos, you know, accounting for their the geometry of the piezos. Uh, and the piezoelectric properties, mainly the D coefficient and that S um, coefficient that we saw here in the slide. <laughs> Uh, according for those two, we uh, a give you know given a certain mode shape, a strain mode shape, we can come up with a relationship between a dis between the, this displacement, I'll call it displacement tip, and the average strain. So they'll be given a mode shape. They will there will be a relationship. Let's call it. Let's call it uh, uh, b -b -b A. Actually, the A is a right term. Um, equals uh, DT. So there'll be some conversion factor between the average strain here and and the displacement there. And there's, there'll be some conversion factor based on geometry of the piezoelectric. 
to be the average strain to be the current, I'll call that B. And I'll call that A. So the current of the P is O, which is the only place there is current, to the displacement of the tip. And there, so there, basically these, are, these will be two constants. And they are, will be affected if the PS material properties change, if you change any other aspects. But if you add a load, like, you know, when we actually impact these two pieces of metal, uh, we will get, what will basically happen is the frequency will slightly change. It'll, instead of this being a free boundary condition, it'll be slightly lossy. It'll be lossy, but will maintain the resonant structure. Uh, so there'll be a slight change in this. So, but it'll be changing a epsilon. It won't be changing too much. Therefore, we can still generally use this uh, constant that we can find. So we can practically go in the lab, you know, working backwards. You can calculate it using FEA and whatnot because it's not a simple structure. You may not be able to derive it using using a closed form solution. But you can go in the lab. You can have your. Um, let me get this guy here. You can measure. That we can basically measure the displacement here using, for example, a laser. You you can measure the displacement here, halt, and then you can measure the current here at resonance. Well, it's called R, and we get a d t tip, and that d tip divided by i r will generally be always be a times b which is whatever, it doesn't matter, it could be like uh, C. <laughs> whatever you measure, it'll always normally be the same. You can calculate it beforehand knowing the piezoelectric properties and using FEA uh, as the most efficient tool to get that number. But basically, it'll always be the same because, the, because it relies on the fact that the loading, uh, although it may be severe, it will generally, we expect that the loading will only change the damping properties, will have most effect on damping of the structure, it will have less effect, much less. On um, the mode shape. So there'll be a current And there'll be a displacement. <clears throat> where the current equals zero, where the current phase I'm calling epsilon i, where that equals zero. For 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 a, generally for for a low loss transducer, then um, the theta for the displacement will generally be 90 degrees or the velocity actually the velocity will be zero degrees as well because when we are in resonance we're actually the velocity is actually in phase so it's so this current more correlates to velocity because as you can remember this is more correlating to charge because of the derivatives involved uh, so in this way, we can, if we control to a phase, a current phase of zero. Of so what we want to do is, uh, when we're driving our uh, device, let's just draw like a kind of a block diagram. So we we input voltage, and we input frequency to our. Transducer. We it outputs displacement and a certain displacement phase <clears throat> with regards to voltage. So voltage and its phase. But we measure out current, amplitude, and the phase of current. And we ask ourselves, 
does our current that we measure equals the current, the target current? That's one question. And the other question is that is our phase that we measure equal to the target phase? And usually we don't have the target phase as zero because of the instability related to driving at directly at the resonance point. Because at the resonance point here, like if you're at resonance and you have this is a, again omega and um, this is d, which is amplitude. Uh, if we just alt slide a little bit from the resonance point, we'll see a large drop in displacement. So that's not good. So usually you might want to even drive here. So if you do change displacement, you aren't change you aren't dramatically changing your uh, display. Uh, you if you do change frequency. Uh, not changing frequency, but the the the, the characteristic curve changes under uh, due to external environment loading, then you wouldn't be completely uh, in an unstable situation. There would be some stability, although that's what you have your high speed control of voltage and frequency in order to minimize that. So we ask these two questions. Um, this question, you know, we we uh, change our phase. Change our frequency to optimize that. And then and for this question, we change our voltage to optimize that. And the controls here and the controls here can both be implemented using whatever control method, proportional, integral, derivative, whatever whatever you want to do, or you can just have logic and all the phases lower than the, you know, if the phase is too low, then you add one hertz. For example, that's the most simple way. Or if the, if the, if the current is too low, you add one volt. If the, if the current is too, too high, you subtract one volt. Uh, but proportional control is a little bit more fancy way of doing it. Um, so this kind of summarizes why? So I'm going to just type that out so it's clear. So how? Let me just put this drawing board to the side. So how do we control a ultrasonic piezoelectric transducer to output a constant amplitude of displacement the answer is we control voltage and and, and frequency in order to s stabilize the current. The current directly relates to the displacement output of the transducer because the current directly relates to the displacement output because there exists a fundamental relationship for a given transducer between the strain seen at the piezo stack or the piezo material which is activating the structure and there, there exists a fundamental relationship between, for a given transducer between the strains of it and the displacement seen at the tip. We consider environmental loading to be to be minimal to be providing negligible um effects on the 
to be providing negligible effects on the uh, mochi. Mochi. YouTube. This is which is negligible effects on the mode shape. So it affects the um it affects basically the Q. No, uh, basically the damping. So you may need the more power, but you wouldn't need more uh Okay, uh, so so the environment and the environmental loading provides negligible effects on the mode shape, but you may need more power. You may need more power. Uh, in other words, you may need more voltage to drive that same displacement, but it wouldn't affect the strip the the current because the current is a sensor property. The current. The, the current is developed due to the direct piezoelectric effect, like a sensor. Basically, this is acts like a sensor. You put you put a voltage, you put a force, alternating force. You get an alternating strain. Then you get from that alternating strain, you get a current. The vibration is due to the indirect or converse uh, sorry not indirect converse electric effect which is the actuator which is how you drive so the uh, phase of the current and its amplitude can be um, controlled by controlling voltage and frequency and this is how we drive the piezo trick device so whether it's temperature changing you know whether we have a temperature or this board here whether we have a temperature changing the uh, the resonance characteristics because that changes the frequency response whether it's um, this difference is material properties because we have we built one transducer then we built two but they may have a difference in frequency um, due to the variation in material properties of components so the, uh, if we track we'll be able to design one controller or one set point for each device you don't have to keep measuring over and over again so it can provide many practical consequences not just environmental loading so also yeah that was the main thing like environmental loading uh, you know when you go to start impacting let's say you know those two metal pieces and you want to join them together uh, in that case you would have a change in frequency change in amplitude so in order to maintain uh, and, and the process wouldn't be the same so the frequency would be let's say this is the frequency this is time you know as you joined that device you may reach a stable frequency you know, after the, when the bond is starting, when you just start to impact or versus when you finish, you'll see a different frequency uh, response. So this control is absolutely necessary in order to maintain the constant output uh, till the very end. So you kind of, you have control. So you don't need to add a sensor, but in, in some select situations, you may need a better sensing capability than is given to you by the current, because again, the current is affected by changing on that mode shape and we said it is negligible but um, it's negligible depending on your application most 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 applications do not need to be that detailed but some do need to be some do need to be that detailed and, and, and especially in but uh, 
for resonance, resonance devices aren't really considered as precision devices. That's more toward piezoelectric actuators um, that operate in precision applications that you may need a, a sensor to monitor. That in addition, with it, with sort of the current or being a secondary uh, aspect of it. Okay, so I think that kind of finishes the lecture. It went on kind of long, but it we sort of went through um, this uh, scenario. All these slides will be online on the website. Um, it is the website is again learnpeasel.org. There is a section to make appointments if you have questions, whether it's a commercial application or whether it's something academic or whether it's something you're curious about. Um, I have specified appointment availability uh, for questions. And with that, I will leave this discussion and we will continue with another topic next time. Thanks for watching.